Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Hulu Plus. Hulu Plus lets you binge on thousands of hit shows anytime, anywhere on your TV, PC, smartphone, or tablet. Visit HuluPlus.com slash know how to start your free two week trial. That's HuluPlus.com slash know how. And by Lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,000 high-quality online courses and training videos, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. Today, you'll know how to get networked videos on your Roku, and then you'll know everything there is to know about studio monitoring. Welcome to Know How. This is Twit's How To Program. We give you some fun tech projects. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And so today uh, we are going to do something. We're going to solve a problem that's actually at my house first. Uh, I, w I have a Roku box. I got a second TV. And Great box. We've talked about my home media server. I've had, we've talked about it in a lot of episodes. And I wanted a way to get my network video onto the Roku. That's ridiculous. I, I mean, I don't understand that every other box does DLNA. It gives you an easy way to get files over the network. The Roku is an excellent product, but it doesn't include that simple feature. Yeah, that's why I always end up calling it a streaming box. Now, back in episode 34, we talked about what DLNA is. It's actually a set of protocols that is supposed to make it really easy for one device to see another device on a network. Like your smart TV should be able to see your Windows PC and the like. But for some reason, the Roku box does not support, at least none of them to this date, support DLNA out of the box. That's just weird. Weird, weird, weird. So to get around this, we're going to figure out well, how we're going to do this, because that's what the show is about. It's about workarounds. And I don't feel like buying a smart TV nope. or buying a PS3 nope. or an Xbox 360 just to have DLNA. So what I'm going to do first is show you how to get network video from a single source over to a Roku box right over here. I'm going to switch the input to HDMI 2. And we're going to see a Roku box once I move forward. OK, so that's going to load up because it's got its little There dude. we go. And set to Hulu right now. Let me go to my little uh, Roku remote, which is on my, my actual phone. So this is stock Roku, right? I mean, you haven't done anything to the box other than turn it on and set it up to look at Hulu. I ain't done nothing. Nice. Honest. Nice. Seriously, oh, honest. OK. OK. okay. So. All right, so the, the, the first thing I want to use is Plex. Now, Plex is the easiest thing to have or uh, to use when you're going to bother setting up your media server at home and then connecting to a Roku because it does it, it's not going to use DLNA, but what it's going to use is Plex to Plex. And all you got to do is first you'll go to the Plex website and pick up Plex Media Server. I've got it right here. Uh, it's a free application. It was on Windows, OS 10, Linux, your NAS box, or even free BSD. So you have no excuse to not have Plex, and it's free. You know Plex, it's an XBMC. Oh, yeah. no, it, it's a great product. I mean, the, the idea is anything you can see on your PC, you can see on your device. It, it just transcodes it and pushes it out to you. Right, so I'm going to show you how to set up Plex. So you're going to have your libraries when it comes to this. So we'll go into Plex. We're going to go into Media Manager. And things have changed since I was a young boy. It turns <laughs> out Plex now has a web interface when it comes to setting up your library. So I'm going to hit Plus and add a section. And my movies, I'm going to go to my folder. This is going to depend on your exact setup. So I'm going to go to my movies folder. And I would hit continue and everything, hit add, and I'm all set. So in this case, I've already set up my movie library and my music library. So all I need to do now is after this thing is indexed, and you can see I can hit movies, my vast collection of four movies, <laughs> The Avengers, Bedazzled, Heathers, and Superman, make sure all of your stuff is on the same network, unless you're using the MyPlex add-on, which is you sign into a service, you can stream it over the internet, but that's for another time. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to go to the Plex app on Roku. The Plex app on Roku is free. You just go into the channel store and download it. I'm going to control the Roku using the application here. Oh, okay. Let's go. And we'll go into Plex. Now, these devices are obviously on the same network. You always want that to be the case. And we're going to retrieve uh, our library right now. And so if I go to Movies, 
going to do this because I can watch the monitor behind right here. So I'm going to do this sight unseen. I want to watch Superman from 1978. One of the best Superman movies, I think, to date because... Nice man, spread, yeah. Man, have I they been it. some really terrible, they, yeah. terrible mm. Superman movies. It's but this sad. is one of the best ones. And what's going to happen is that movie is going to play on this Roku box. Now, obviously, things are wired, but it is going to go over there. So we wait, and we wait, and we wait. Now, the reason why we're waiting is because the computer actually has to do all the transcoding so that it's understandable by the Roku box. And there we go. And we there we it. go. We got it running. So that's, that's the real best solution if you just have one media library. The fastest thing you can do is get Plex Media Server, put it on that box, and then uh, add it to your library. Then these two devices can talk to each other, and I didn't have to get a new smart TV. Right. But the thing is, I wanted to have one solution for pretty much everything. So I do have a PS3. That's one of the reasons why I have a DLNA server in the house at all is because I want everything to handle the same library. So this is going to continue. I better stop that before this gets pulled <laughs> down from YouTube uh, when we have it. Oh, by the way, yeah, we have episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash knowhow. I'm going to go back to the home screen right there. For multiple solutions. So let's say you have a Windows PC, you have, uh, you have a Plex server, and maybe even your phone. All these devices are DLNA uh, devices. How on earth do you get all of those points into this? You got any idea? Uh, I mean, you could, as the chat room is pointing out, install programs on each and every single one to transcode the, the, the programming so that it works. But I mean, that sounds like such a kludge. I'm sure you've got an easier way to do it. I've got a different kind of kludge. Oh, right. <laughs> totally good. different one. Uh, I'm going to show you something called Play 2. We actually talked about Play 2. It's an Android app. We talked about this a while back when we were talking about setting up your own sort of Sonos-like experience. Now, it's an application that you can try for free if you wanted to. Let me bring up the application right now on my amazing cell phone of awesomeness. <laughs> yes, I cracked my screen. Yes, I know about it. Yes, I'm going to fix it with my iFixit toolkit. So there's two versions of Play 2 right here. I highly suggest getting Play 2 Lite when you're doing this so you make sure that everything works before you buy it. The Play 2 app is $5. I do find it very good. I'm going to show you all of the U, uh, all of the DLNA servers that are on the network. So if I home media, you're going to see PS3 media server running somewhere. Okay. Spider Monkey, which is the name of my Windows laptop over there, because every Windows machine does do Correct, does right. DLNA. Built in. So if you've got a Windows machine, you do have DLNA. And there's my Plex media server. Now, if I also want to send stuff from my phone over to that device there, I can go to device media, we'll go to videos, and we're going to take a look at my kid on a train. It's going to be very exciting. When you're setting this up, you see the video playing right there. The interface is kind of not so hot. I'm going to say it's not the best designed looking device or application, but you would just hit this button, play. It's going to transition to our Roku box because the Play 2 app was already installed. Same kind of thing. You go to the channel store, you get the Play 2 app, it's free, and the video is being sent over that way. Now, we are in the black hole of horribleness when it comes to all kinds of interference. You're seeing the loading issues right now. Right. At home, I don't have this kind of yeah, problem. We've got all sorts of stray RF going on here. But what I like about this is you've got a single interface that allows you to push out to the player. I, I, there, again, there's a lot of people who are saying, well, buy a WD player, buy oh, yes. this player. Buy, but what you're trying to do is say, look, I want to have a solution that's going to work for everything. I, like, I think that's what you're giving yeah, us. Yeah, Java 678 right there. I as the Kluge Actar. That is me. <laughs> I think of myself more of a, 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 I rig things. I always make things work for at least 15 minutes. Uh, but I want to show you how to set up your Roku on this device because it doesn't find it on its own. What you, what you do is, let me go back. You'd hit this little option here, and you hit Add device. Now, what you have to do to get this to work, you select Roku. You have to get your IP address for your Roku. Uh, this is rather trivial. You can go to your network. I mean, you can go to your uh, admin page, right. check out your network, or all you got to do is go to your Roku box, go to the About section, go into settings, uh, the network settings, get your IP address. In this case, I've actually already added it. It's like 125. If you can see that there, 192. 168.1.125. And again, the reason why you have to do this is because the Roku doesn't have DLNA, so it's not automatically going to get those settings. you got to tell it where the box is. And by the way, this application also works with AirPlay. So if you have an Apple TV, you can send things over. Now, what is the best media server, what I have found on this? Like, I, I've tried PS3 media server. So if we go to home media, you'll see this list again. you got PS3 media server, Spider Monkey, and Plex. Now, 
I have found, and I know this is gonna sound silly, Plex played the best quality video huh. when it came to everything. Uh, but PS3 Media Server worked well with music, things worked okay. A little bit weird in the studio, as you see, again, back uh, loading. But there's one more thing I wanna show you. If you don't wanna shell out five whole dollars, you can always use the Roku app itself. Let me go grab that. The Roku app, which is actually the remote control, which is free, what you can do is, with certain Rokus, it's not every single version of it, but you can go play on Roku here. Now, this is only going to look at the all the uh, data from your phone. So if you're talking about bringing things from your network, that's not what's going on here. But I did want to give you guys this option. I can go into my camera roll, and I'm going to play this video. Now, what I found was a different kind of quality. If we go back to the screen here, play on Roku is starting. And I'm showing that same train video. I don't know if you're going to see the quality difference that we've seen a bunch of times. But in our experience, every single time we've run this video, very slowly. Very slowly. We run the video, the quality is, you probably oh, can't make that up, goodness. but you can, you can attest That's this. That's pixelated. It's very, very blocky. So it might not look so bad from far away. So as long as you're like back here, where you guys are, it doesn't look so bad, but the, the uh, Play on Roku app didn't do so well sending the video, it. and you Don't saw the quality of video yeah, from Play the Play 2. Pay $5, my goodness. So that's the easiest ways I have found for getting network video onto a Roku box right now until Roku decides to allow DLNA to work. Please, Roku, just fix your stuff. It's a great box. We just don't understand why it doesn't have this very See, my basic kids shouldn't be pixelated. No, there's no What's reason for that. What's up with that? I got an HD TV. I shot it in your HD. kid's always loading for some reason. I, ugh, come on, please. He's like he's carrying a giant thing of frosted glass. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to stop playing that video as it continues over there. Uh, I think we should... We got a quick tip coming up, right? We got about a quick tip coming a up. A ground right? hum. Ground hum. Because you might have ground hum. You know that annoying buzz you get sometimes on your audio system? Audio system. Yeah, okay. not great. Don't like that. So we're going to figure out how to get rid of that pod. You're going to help us out with that in just mm -hmm. a second. But first, we should take a break and thank our friends at Hulu Plus. Now, Padre, you've got Hulu Plus on your uh, I do. S4. Four? I want this to is a Galaxy S4. It's a nice little device, but uh, what I love about it is I can get the Hulu Plus app right on it. Now, you guys have probably tried Hulu.com, but Hulu Plus is so much more. With Hulu Plus, you can watch your favorite shows anytime, anywhere. It lets you watch thousands of hit TV shows and movies in the living room or on the go with your smartphone or tablet. Our Roku box can do it. Padre's uh, S4 can do it. My iPad, pretty much anything can handle Hulu Plus. Uh, some of the movies out there, the Criterion collections out there, American Psychos out there, by the way, if you like that kind of thing, Hoop Dreams or documentaries, pretty cool stuff. Uh, with Hulu Plus, you can watch your favorite TV shows, Jimmy Kimmel Live, Shark Tank, Family Guy, Almost Humans on there, which I really, really enjoy watching on Hulu Plus. And you can watch every episode of shows like Lost, Doctor Who, Community, and Star Trek. Every episode uh, right on Hulu Plus. You can also check out exclusive content on Hulu Plus. Uh, they've got originals like The Wrong Man's and Behind the Mask. I have watched every single episode of Behind the Mask. I talk about this incessantly because it's a real quality show. It's a documentary series about the lives of the people inside the mascot suits. So if you've got people, you, see, you go to a sporting event and you're like, why is that guy dressed like a mascot or like, like, like a Milwaukee buck? You can find out about their lives. It's really intriguing. That's only on Hulu Plus. And you get access to a collection of ad-free movies as well as ad-free kids content. Sesame Street is on Hulu Plus without advertising. So you're going to watch that. Your kids won't be asking you to buy stuff because there's no ads right there. And for only $7.99 a month, you can catch up on current shows, binge on old favorites, or catch a great movie, stream as many TV shows and movies as you want, wherever you want. And right now, you can try Hulu Plus free for two weeks when you go to HuluPlus.com slash know-how. That's a special offer for our audience. Make sure you use HuluPlus.com slash know-how so they know we sent you and you can get your extended free trial and that will really help us out. You just go slash know-how. Uh, we thank Hulu Plus for their support of Twit and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Hulu Plus. Hulu Plus is awesome. Hulu Plus is awesome. You know what's not awesome? Ground hum. Ground hum. <laughs> Whether we're building a brand new home theater system, installing a car stereo, or creating a new board for our podcasting studio, there's one enemy that links us together, 
And that's the annoying sound of ground hum. In order for us to combat ground hum, we need to know what causes it. In an ordinary system, current flows nice and easily through the system to ground. As long as there's one ground, everything sounds perfect. The problem is that in many systems, there will be multiple paths to ground, either a faulty component or a frayed conductor or some insulation that's not quite doing the trick. When I have multiple paths to ground, what will happen is that there will be a differential voltage across those different grounds, and that differential voltage can destroy the system at worst, and at best, create that annoying ground loop hum. There are really two ways to eliminate the hum. The first is to remove all the excess ground paths, which unfortunately is a lot harder than it sounds. And the second is to isolate the system or remove the unwanted frequencies. In order for us to be able to do that, I think you might want to follow a six-fold process that I've developed over the years that has been very successful in removing ground hum. And that six-fold process is to isolate, identify, repair, replace, look outside, and upgrade. The first step is to isolate the hum. Quite simply, it means that I remove connectors and cables from my system until the hum goes away. That very last connector, that very last cable, is connected to the circuit, to the pathway, to the component that is causing the hum. Now, I'm not done. Once I have isolated, I need to identify what is it within that circuit, that pathway, that component group that's causing the hum. What I want to look for is I want to look for any sort of cuts in the insulation. I want to look for frayed connectors. I want to look for any detritus around the connectors that could possibly be causing a bridge and therefore my ground loop. Uh, once I've isolated it, I need to look at repairing. If it's a break in the insulation, can I tape over it? Can I put some heat shrink tubing? If it's detritus, can I clean it away? If there's actually a component that's damaged, is it possible to repair that component? Once I move past repair, I need to look at replacing. Now, hopefully it's going to be something like a cable, and if it's a cable, you should have spares. Swap it out, see if that's causing the hum, and you're good to go. Now, one quick note, please. If you find out that it's a cable, a connector, or an adapter, once you've removed it, throw it away. Mark it for destruction, or even better, tear it up. Cut it into pieces. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people remove faulty cables, throw them into a box, forget that they were faulty, and then put them back into circulation. That's a definite no-no. The next step, if that doesn't work, if a simple replacement doesn't get rid of your hum, is to look outside. Now, this is one of those things that's more of an art than a science, but you want to see if there's an external source, something like fluorescent lights, or a big suspect is always dimmable lights that could be causing the hum. One of the things I found is that often when I'm hearing a hum, it's because the equipment is on the same circuit as a major appliance, your washer, your dryer, or your refrigerator. If you have your soundboard or your component on the same circuit that you've got your refrigerator, you're probably going to get a little bit of noise from the compressor, the motor, whatever it's going to be. Now, the last step, once you've looked outside, if all else fails, is to upgrade. Now, this is something that you would prefer not to do. This means that you're going to try to isolate the system or eliminate the high-frequency noise because you can't get rid of it with any of those other processes. There's two things that I've found have been very effective. The first is this. Try to start with this. This is a ferrite core. Quite simply, a ferrite core is a piece of ceramic that wraps around a length of cable and prevents it from being an antenna. You see, when you have a length of cable, it can either receive high frequencies or send them off. When you wrap a ferrite core around it, it kills off those high frequencies, preventing that interference from occurring in the first place. Always good to have a couple of these because these are cheap. You can buy a few dozen for just a couple of cents. It's a nice place to start. A little more expensive is to look at something like this. This is an isolating transformer. Now, most transformers are technically isolating. A transformer works by having two sets of coils and having an inductive voltage flow from one to the other. But not all transformers are the same. This isolating transformer actually has insulation between the two coils to make sure that there's only inductive voltage, inductive current going from one coil to the next. Essentially, it isolates the system from the power source, and that means that all of that hum, all of that noise, will be at a place that won't affect my audio system. Now, I've used this six-fold process to great effect over the years, and I hope that it helps you to combat the hum. 
Okay, so that catchy acronym was what now? Erglu? Erglu. Something like that. It totally so makes sense if you're drunk. It's almost like when you're swearing, you're like, what's that noise? Erglu. Isolate? Yeah, I couldn't make any sort of catchy shield nope. type thing. Okay, so. no shield, yeah. you know, strategic. Yeah. But that does work. Now, th there was one thing. I, I know that people in the chat room are going to start pointing this out. One of the things that pros like to point out is, well, you could eliminate ground hum just by lifting the mains. Don't ever do that, unless you're completely experienced, because you're essentially saying anyone who touches this could die, and that tends to be bad. Yeah, we don't we don't advocate for that kind of thing no. on this show, so no. be safe when you're removing ground hum. And the other thing is, uh, th that, that little ferrite core thing, yeah. I used to live by a radio tower in Vermont. It would actually get seep into my Ooh. audio, and that simple little core mm -hmm. thing, it's about 25 cents or something mm -hmm. at Radio Shack, just saves you so much hassle. You should have a box of those, and that could be the first thing you try. I mean, they're cheap, you throw them on, if they don't work, you take them off, put them someplace else. But that little piece of ceramic could just prevent a lot, a lot of annoyance. So we seem to have lots of headphones. Are okay. we gonna do isolation chamber next? Or we, we could, we well, could. Well, actually, I, that, that wouldn't be a bad thing. We could do a, like a sensory deprivation tank know-how. That's an idea. It's about the That's size of this idea. table. I think I like fit this. in there. But anyway, I don't. We're not yeah. doing that today. No, though. we're not doing that today. Okay. We're talking all about studio monitors. All righty. We've been covering podcasting the last couple of episodes, picking lights, picking cameras, picking your microphones. This is picking your monitors. So you want to be able to hear back what's going on on your podcast. Well, you're, you're going to need to choose a style and a type of tech. I can't use my iPod earbuds that are so amazingly audio. You can absolutely this, use those, but you'll never be on the Twit TV network because we know, I mean, I, the chat room knows this, it sounds horrible, right? It makes a clacking sound and it just looks bad. So there are a couple of different options that you can use to pick a studio monitor that will work for you. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to go over the different kinds of studio monitors. And the first is going to be, well, active or passive speakers. So this is what you might consider normal for any sort of studio. This is a unit I got a, a few years back. This is a Polk Hitmaster. They don't actually sell these anymore, but they still sell powered speakers. The nice thing about a powered speaker is everything is contained within the unit. So the amplifier, the equalizer, that's all built in. So you just give it power and an audio source. Especially if you're building a studio in a very small area, this is nice because it doesn't require any sort of external amplification. You just give it a signal, it's good to go. This is the kind of thing that you'd see at the foot of like musicians and that kind of right. thing? That's Yeah, this is an actual stage monitor. That's, it, it goes that's on why the it's shaped like that. So you'd be in front of it, you'd be rocking out, and you can hear it a lot easier. Right, right. And, and you know, there's, there's passive and there's active. For studios, I tend to prefer uh, the active ones just mm -hmm. because, again, they're a lot easier to set up. But they do tend to be a bit more expensive, and if you're doing one of these complicated setups, uh, they can sometimes not really give you what you what want. What does the Hitmaster from Poke or an, uh, an equivalent cost? This one you can get on like eBay right now for about forty bucks. Okay. So I mean, they start Pretty low, reasonable. but then if you get up into the high end, like Polk actually has really high end ones I know. for several thousand dollars. So again, pick your budget. Yeah, if you plan to win the lottery. Get. Yeah, if you win the lottery, then go ahead and pick up the really nice one. If not, maybe maybe the forty dollar one might do you well. Okay, so what else could we use if not using the uh, the, stu the studio amp there? Right. So let's say you want to have something that just you can hear, right? You can use a set of headphones. Now, I've got a couple of different headphones here. Why don't you hold on to this one? I, that's one of my favorites. These are snazzy. Those now the pressure, are don't snazzy. drop it. Snazzy, yeah. Ooh. Now these are over-the-ear headphones. There's there's really two types. There's closed ear and there's open ear. When I talk about closed ear, these are all closed ear types. It means it gives you really good sound isolation. What? Sound isolation. Oh, sound isolation. Yes, sound isolation, yes. Now, the, the good thing about that is, it, especially in a studio environment, it's nice sometimes to be able to close out everything that's going mm -hmm. around and just listen to what's coming through the mics. I mean, you know that, right? Because oh, yeah, I've had my, I've, but in my, uh, in my experience, because I did a lot of long audio sessions, right. I liked the open ear one because it allowed basically yes. airflow. Mm -hmm. But the thing about the open one, as far as I remember, maybe things have changed. It obviously bleeds out audio. So if anyone's in, in, uh, in the room with you, they're hearing what you're hearing. Right, right. Uh, and it's obviously not as isolating as this. So if you're in a room, you might not even hear something like ground hum uh, unless you're using something that isolates the audio. Exactly, yeah. The open ears tend to sound better. They, they give better reproduction. The, uh, the closed ear, just like you might expect from like a closed speaker, they tend to be a bit boomier. They, they emphasize the bass. The sound's not as natural, but you get much better isolation and you can hear just what the sound is, sound source is giving you. So I can hear just what's coming through the mic, not what's coming from the room. 
Okay, yeah, so this, not bad. these are snazzy. They're still fancy. They don't have the like red and blue. They actually have right, an R. Right. Now th that's an Audio Technica ATH 50S. Mm -hmm. That runs for about a hundred dollars, and that's I mean that's a, that's a really this reasonable is a price. Fantastic studio monitor. This is the one I use. Yeah, that might make you like hesitate right away. Like a hundred dollars for an audio for just for your headphones. Right. Right. But that is a lot of. Yeah, it's a, it's a good investment. Now, you've also got this. This is the Sony MDR7506. This is also about $100. It's a closed back. Some people prefer this. I'm a bit more of a, you know, the Audio Technica guy. These are the M30s, 40 bucks. So, you know, a lot of the same technology. It's neo neodymium magnets, closed ear. Sounds good, but, you know, again, you just want choice. Now, going past this, there's something that both of us use a lot. It's this little thing. Little in-ear IFB, which stands for a, in, a what is it, interruptible fold-back monitor. Now, the nice thing about this is it becomes mostly invisible, right? We can tuck it behind us, and it's, it just gives us the yeah, sound. Yeah, that's, that's how I heard you, even though I had those isolation things on. I exactly. couldn't hear it if this exactly. piece wasn't in my ear. Now, really quickly, what you want to do is you want to choose the source that's best for you, because these are options, you know, from different price ranges, but you need to choose the one that's going to work for your podcast studio. And what you want to do is you want to ask yourself four questions. The first one is, what style of content will I be creating? The second one is, how many people people will be in my studio at any given time. The third one is how good are my mics at sound rejection? And the fourth one is do I care if people see my monitor? Because obviously for that first question, what style of content will I be creating in my studio? If it's just talk radio, I don't really need to worry about accurate reproduction, right? Because it's just my voice. So I, I could probably not take this. I probably don't need something really, really expensive. If it's going to be something where there's a lot of people in my studio, I don't want everyone to need headphones. Maybe I do want to look at something more open, like a, a studio speaker. However, if my mics aren't good at sound rejection, I can't use open ear uh, headphones or this because that sound will bleed in. I get that nasty echo. And finally, it's, well, do I care? if people see these big cans on the side of my head. If, if I do, if I'm conscious and I, I want to have more of a look like this, then the IFB is the way to go. These are all the questions that will tell you what piece of tech you need for your podcast studio. Somebody in the chat room asking, what about Beats? No. 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 <laughs> no. They look good. No. That's about it, though. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's a fascinating set of information there. But yeah, since we're doing video, we've got little inner bits, or we could keep those in our head. We just look a little silly. In my earballs. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's uh, stop and take a break and thank our friends at lynda.com. Uh, you know, you guys watch Know How, you know lynda.com. They're an online learning company that can help you learn pretty much anything. You're talking about creative works, software, business skills, uh, whatever you want to learn to achieve your personal, professional goals, lynda.com has courses for you. With a lynda.com subscription, Members receive unlimited access to a vast library of high quality, current and engaging video tutorials across a wide variety of subjects. So if you're into software, you can learn Excel, Photoshop, Dreamweaver, like tons of courses. Uh, if you want to be a better photographer, they've got photography courses, videography classes, DSLR video if you want to really learn how to use those things. And of course, I'm currently taking it's called creativity training. And that's a, it's an oddball kind of one because they have all kinds of courses. It's by St Stefan Muma, who is the author of six books on creativity. And he actually looks at creativity as not this inherent thing that people are born with, but as problem solving and not artistry. It's a fascinating course. I'm currently in the middle of it. And because this is lynda.com, you get this excellent course that you can take from your laptop to your tablet to whatever device because you can move from device to device if you've got time to learn like in line at the bank wherever you are you can use lynda.com's apps to pick up where you left off and you saw that video there high quality video production when you're being explained these concepts text is nice but you know video and audio that really helps at least me have these concepts sink into my brain i took the procrastination course 20 minutes, how to stop procrastinating, actually. It had fascinating ideas, uh, and that was also by a pro trained professional. That's the other thing. The uh, folks that are teaching these courses, they are experts in their field. And right now, you should realize that there's over 2,000 courses with new courses being added daily. The holidays are upon us, and lynda.com has courses to help you take great family portraits, including Douglas Kirkland on photog uh, photographing kids and families and you can capture your holiday travels with DSLR video tips. There's even a course on enhancing travel photos 
with Photoshop and Lightroom. So maybe you didn't take the best photo, but you can make it look better at the end of the day. They've also got searchable transcripts that let you, let you search inside a video. So if you're like, I remember that word, you can go ahead and do a quick search, find whatever you need to. Uh, it's only $25 a month for access to Linda's entire course library, or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's project using the exact same assets they were using. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash know-how to access the entire library. That's over 2,000 courses free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash know-how. You can give the gift of learning this year with a gift membership to lynda.com. It's the perfect no wrapping, no shipping, last minute gift. Just pick, click the get gift membership link at lynda.com slash knowhow. That's the gift membership link at lynda.com slash knowhow. I gotta tell you, Ayaz, I'm, I'm really hooked on Lynda content. I mean, it's, it's really well done. It's not like jumping from video to video at YouTube. They actually give you a recognized, followable course load. And, and you end up with a whole lot more knowledge than you had when you started. I yeah, like it. It's really easy to it's discover lots of new things there. Uh, yeah. Speaking of discovering things, we went over to our Google Plus community uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe last week. I don't remember. Time flies, you know. Mm -hmm. We issued a challenge to you guys, uh, and we have this green screen footage of myself and Alex Lindsay running away from a green screen. And we're going to feature one of the, uh, one of the entries <laughs> next week. We'll show you the best of uh, this. This is from Joe Kunha. Here's our green screen challenge. He has decided to put us in the movie Dark Knight uh, Rises That's not bad. That's as we not run away bad. in slow-mo. Uh, now, last week, I mistakenly forgot to include the link for the green screen footage. We'll have that at twit.tv slash kh. Go to our Google Plus community, G+. Plus. That gets a golf clap. Seriously, that was well done. <laughs> that, that just made put a huge smile on my face uh, when it came to that. Go to gplus.to slash twitkh. That's where you can find links to uh, well, one, the, the actual green screen footage. And you can actually get the high quality ProRes version right there. Or you can go to twit.tv slash kh because this time I promise, along with our show notes, I will have the link in there. I apologize for that oversight, but it will be there. How else can they connect with us? Well, you know, you can always connect us with us the old school way, and that is to email us. You, might, you may have heard of email. Your parents probably did it. It's uh, knowhow at twit.tv. Go ahead and write us with any questions about the show. Maybe you want to ask me, hey, where did IS put the green screen footage? I'll get right back to you. <laughs> yeah, he'll do that. Or I'll write. I've been going back and forth. And you guys have had some great show ideas over there. Also, Twitter. Always checking out the hashtag twitkh. Write any tweet you want. Put hashtag twitkh. I'll see it. Padre will see it. Shannon will see it. Brian might even see it. He's the guy. We'll all see it. Behind the... Uh, behind the desk there. He's so super excited. Any other way they can get in contact with us? Uh, well, I mean, they can show up pigeon. here if they wanted to. Yeah. No, no, well, don't send pigeons, but you can come over to the studio. That's all yeah. other thing. Uh, I think that's it for that's us this week. That's a packed show. Packed. Yeah. yeah. It's like we compressed it into a tiny little package. Uh, if anything, we said, you're like, wait, what was the, where's the, where are the links? Twit.tv slash KH? We give great show notes. Show notes, except for that one time I messed yeah, up. Yeah. Show notes at twit.tv slash KH. And, uh, now that you know how to watch network video on your Roku and how you should be setting up your studio monitor, why don't you go try it? <laughs>